Welcome back to the Sip and Feast podcast. Today we're going to talk about Thanksgiving and specifically the game plan for Thanksgiving Day to minimize your stress. We're going to go over some of the tips and tricks that we have have used over the years. And so a lot of these might be common sense to you, but some of them might be new. And we've hosted Thanksgiving more times than I even care to admit. And I might sound a little bit negative in my tone there, but- You sound jaded. You sound bitter. <laughs> I do sound jaded. It's It's because it's a tall task to have to host any holiday. But when it's holiday after holiday after holiday, like like we do, it um it does come with some stress. You sound like you're upset with our siblings that they're not taking over. No, it's not that. And I do actually, I do enjoy hosting. It is there is an element of fun, right? As Mary Poppins would say, there is an element of fun in it, but it does get to be stressful. So I think through the years of us hosting. We have come up with some some tips. We don't just have tips for you as a host or hostess. We're also going to share some tips for you if you are going to be a guest. This is all coming from the perspective of us being the host. So the tips that we're going to give if you're a guest are going to be tips that can help you limit the stress of that host. <laughs> yes. I, I would I would this say. This is a self-serving. Yeah, a little a self-serving. A little self-serving. But, but this podcast okay. is really for our family members, okay? <laughs> <laughs> No. We think this is going to help you, though. I think we should get into it right now. Yeah, let's start. By the time this podcast airs, right, Thanksgiving's going to be about 10 days away. And before you get stressed, we want you to just take a breath and relax because it's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it really will be. But I think I think some of these are really going to help you. This doesn't have to be a hard day at all. These tips really are geared more towards food and, and serving and, and that sort of thing. Um, we obviously can't share with you or give you tips on how to minimize the the stress that your, <laughs> your family members may bring along with them. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. That's a whole, that's another podcast probably not the Sip and Feast podcast. Yeah, have the wild turkey and uh, the cheap scotch in the other room for Uncle Bob. Or You mentioned Uncle Bob in the, pre- the previous we podcast. We don't have an Uncle Bob, so we that's don't. why I could keep saying so it. So one of our listeners who emails us regularly, his name is Bob. And he was like, Jim, <laughs> on behalf of IBS, the International Bob Society, the Bob Society, I take offense to what you said about Uncle Bob. He, he said he agreed with what you said about Aunt Betty, though. I don't remember what you said about Aunt Betty. Um, anyway, we don't have a, an Uncle Bob. That's a, just a fictional thing that, that Jim came up with. Yeah. What we're going to do is try and give you a timeline to follow, right? So by the time this podcast airs, when you start listening to this, it's going to be anywhere from 10 to seven days before Thanksgiving. And one of the things, or one of the first things that you should do is to decide on your menu, right? Try and get an outline for your menu, what you're going to serve. And the first thing to ask yourself is, are you going to be doing a fresh or a frozen turkey? If you are partaking in turkey. They are. Let's assume that you are partaking in turkey. And if you are using a frozen turkey, and we'll go into it after, you're going to have to give yourself a certain amount of time. You won't need 10 days to defrost it unless you're using the largest turkey in your county. Okay? Mm-hmm. But, it w- but it does take a lot of time. Yeah. And if you are using a frozen, you can get it now. And then you can store it in your freezer. That way you've got that part out of the way. Yep. Um, there are some pros to using fresh, right? Fresh eliminates the need for thawing. And in yeah. your experience, Jim. Fresh or better. It, it tastes better. A- any meat you buy will be better when it's not frozen. That means steak, pork, turkey, whatever. But, you know, practicality, and we're all about practicality here at Sip and Feast, means that most people are going to be using a frozen turkey. We're using a frozen turkey this year. I have it defrosting right now in the Sip and Feast kitchen below. And that one, I'm going to be um, shooting photos for a spatchcock turkey. Mm -hmm. If you do go with a frozen turkey and you're gonna do a dry brine, 
you can you don't have to it doesn't have to be completely thawed so you can that can give you a little bit of leeway there i don't even recommend a wet brine nobody wet brines turkeys anymore they really don't okay yeah i think we'll get into the we'll get into it the all brining later, but, a little bit more but yeah simply a fresh turkey is going to taste better we did a fresh turkey last year i believe or two years ago it was expensive it was like a hundred dollar turkey uh we drove out east in long island to a turkey farm but you know do either one is fine and then after you decide if you're going to be using a frozen or fresh, you also have to figure out if you want to use a turkey breast, which could be a little bit easier. I prefer a turkey breast. Yeah. Definitely I, prefer the turkey breast. And most people prefer the turkey breast. You know, again, Uncle Bob probably wants the legs. Okay. But for all intents and purposes, you're better off with a breast because they cook at different rates too. And you, know, you want it, you got to cook the breast till, till it's perfect. And then your dark meat will not be perfect. It will be undercooked. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're assuming that people are using a turkey, but then if you want another meat, there's other ones to consider as well. Yeah. And those are like ham, right? Or a pork loin. Those or, are both good. Yeah. And then if you're maybe having a smaller Thanksgiving, like maybe there's four of you, maybe you don't have the turkey, maybe do a roast chicken. Definitely there, there's flexibility here. I do like the 12 pound turkey and a ham. I like that combo. Yeah. Because you buy the spiral ham, you could get it at Costco. You could also get your turkey at Costco. And the ham is just like foolproof. You just put it in the oven, put the glaze on. And yeah. It makes it a lot easier than working with like a 30 pound turkey. For sure. Okay. So once you've decided if you're going to have your turkey, decide on your side dishes. And I think it's a good idea to limit your sides. There's no need for 12 different side dishes. I would really try and narrow it down to between five and seven side dishes. I agree with that. And we went into the sides in the last episode. If you haven't, if for some reason you're here and you haven't listened to the previous episode, make sure to listen to that one because that really goes in depth about the sides. Mm -hmm. I really agree with Tara here. Five or seven is more than enough, especially if you're making this yourself. If Again, if you have help, and people are going to bring over stuff for you, then you can add a couple more to the list. Yeah. And that actually leads me into my next um, my next item that you should be doing at the 7 to 10 day before mark. And that's touching base with your guests, right? You want to check with them, make sure they're still coming, let them know what sides they can bring or desserts. Some There are some really good, um, there are some really good sides that can be outsourced. I think some of those include cranberry sauce, desserts, appetizers. Those are all great. I would outsource them. And, you know, this is like, this could be a sense of stress here because especially with certain family members, some of them might be very strong, uh, a strong personality and they don't want to be told what to bring. Mm -hmm. So you really got to take control here. It's your house. You're the one who's having it for everybody, and everybody really should be thankful about that. I sound like I'm just talking about our, pers our from our perspective, but guess what? I'm probably really speaking to you here because you're probably listening to this because you're the one who's going to be hosting it. You take control here. You don't leave it up to someone because if you leave it up to someone, they're going to make the same thing that maybe you're making or maybe somebody else is making. And the last thing you want to do is have two competing sweet potato casseroles that's because right. one of them is going to be bad and one of them is going to be good <laughs> and a lot of feelings are going to be hurt. Yeah, that's true. And I also think it's good to set rules. You can say, bring a dessert that does not require refrigeration because there's nothing worse than when somebody shows up at your house and you have a fully loaded fridge because it's a holiday and they have like a giant cheesecake and they're like, oh, it has to be refrigerated. Yeah. No. Say, please bring something that doesn't require refrigeration. Please bring something that doesn't require you to take up space in my kitchen so that you can prepare it when you get to my house. If you're a guest, yeah. when you show up, everything should be prepped. All you should do is whip off the tin foil or the plastic or whatever container you're bringing it in. Heating it up is fine. I think it's fine to bring something that needs to be heated, but if there's any sort of assembly or refrigeration required. Yeah, absolutely. That is really important. Don't think you're doing someone a favor and then bring over something that you need to chop, slice, dice, whatever, saute, 
do multiple different cooking processes, taking up the, their counters, that's not helping them at all. Make things that are, offer to make things that are going to be ready to go, mm -hmm. just completely ready to go. Yep. Another great thing to ask people to bring, which I ask all the time, pick up, a, if you're, when you're on your way here, pick up a bag of ice. Yes. And have a cooler ready to go. That's the day of though. Um, okay. The, the next thing you should be doing seven to 10 days before Thanksgiving is shopping for any of those non-perishable items, napkins, coffee, plates. If you're going to use paper plates, yeah. I know a lot of people, I mean, I personally like to not use paper yeah, plates on I, Thanksgiving. I think that's one of the, this is one of the few days that I wouldn't use paper mm -hmm. plates. Yeah. But that's um, just, that's just me. I mean, no, like if you want to do that, do that. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're hosting 30 people, yeah. then by all of means, course. use the paper plates. Um, the other thing I have that you can do at this point, the seven to 10 days before, is if you are in an Italian American family, it is highly likely that you are going to be making a lasagna or some other type of baked pasta, like yeah. stuffed shells. You can make that at this point and freeze it. Yeah, that's definitely something to do if, if, if you're going to have that type of meal. We went into it maybe for a minute in last episode. But yeah, like a, a typical Italian-American Thanksgiving day would be, and I'm talking like really hardcore, like people who are in their 70s, this will make, this will sound more familiar. Church, antipasta, lasagna, or you know, shells or managot, something like that. And then then you're finally getting into your turkey and sides and then a ton of desserts. That would be the order of everything. You could throw a stromboli in there with the antipasto and you can throw in stuffed mushrooms with the antipasto. So two, do you agree with all that? That all sounds mm -hmm. pretty basic. And then a lot of times they'll have, instead of just a turkey for dinner, it'll be three or four meats. In fact, stuffed mushrooms are one of the things that I think is a good thing to outsource yep. to folks because yep. it can be assembled and cooked ahead of time. Then you just bring it over and just reheat it. Absolutely. Okay. So that was the seven to 10 days before Thanksgiving. Yeah. Kind of the game right? plan. Let's move on to the five day before Thanksgiving. Just right before you go there, that game plan means you're kind of softening up people. You're softening up your, your family members, your relatives. You're kind of like taking control here. You're the quarterback and they, you know, you're given instructions and they got to be playing with you here at this point, you know, because everything now when we're moving into the five day period hinges on people following those directions, right? Yeah. But also hinges on your management of the situation. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They got to be with you. Yeah. And even if you don't have folks to outsource it to, and you're going to make this yourself, that'll be fine. Yeah. That's where the limiting the sides comes in. That's why we were, we we're actually talking about this from the perspective of you're not even managing those outside sources. You can do all this yourself. And it is very easy to do all this yourself if you make things ahead of time. That's right. All right. So now we're five days out. Okay. And I think this is a good time to talk about thawing, right? If you're using the frozen turkey, now is the time to figure out if you're going to thaw it or when. Yeah. So I'm gonna read this. This is the USDA recommends thawing your turkey in the refrigerator. Yep. And they suggest allowing one day for every four to five pounds. So for example, if you have a 16 pound turkey, it will take about four days to thaw. Yeah. So once thawed, the turkey is safe to store in the refrigerator for another two days. Yeah. So you really could start thawing it, again, for a 16 pound turkey, you could start thawing it six days before Thanksgiving, okay? And that's per the USDA. My experience, it's a, it takes a little bit longer. Now, again, this is gonna be determined on where you keep your refrigerator. Most refrigerators will have a setting of, I think, 39 to 44. So if you're at 44, it's gonna thaw probably a 16 pounder might or a full 24 hours quicker. So there's some math involved here and you have to, you know, you're assuming that your temperature reading is accurate in your refrigerator. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right, so Saturday. Thanksgiving's always on a Thursday. We're talking about the Saturday before Thanksgiving. Now would be the time to move your turkey into the fridge and start thawing. We're gonna operate under the assumption that you're using a 12 pound turkey 
for illustrative purposes here. I, and I like a 12 pound turkey. I think it's the best size turkey that you can make. It's It will give you about, you know, 10 servings. If It's basically 10 servings if you're just eating turkey. But if you have all these sides and everything, you could probably get more servings out of it. Especially, you know, if you're doing a ham, I think you could do a 12 pound turkey, you know, in a 10 pound ham or whatever and pretty much serve 20 people. Don't quote me on that. You know, you can look at some guides online too that give you the exact numbers. But I would rather do rather do two 12 pound turkeys than do one 24 pound turkey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. How I mean, it would take a long time for a 24 to. Well, it wouldn't take any longer. It's just that I get better cooking with a 12 pounder. I prefer to if I'm going to do a whole turkey. I prefer to do a spatchcock mm -hmm. technique. That's when you cut the backbone out of it and you lay it flat. You get more even cooking. You can do a lot better. You get you get the thighs and the breast to cook closer together versus when you you know when you're doing a say you're doing you are doing a 24 pound turkey, you know you got the breast up there and you know it's getting more heat and then you got to start doing shenanigans like building a shield for for your breast and all all these silly things that you don't want to be doing. If you spatchcock it and you flatten it, it's it's the best way. But you can't spatchcock a 24 pound turkey. Now, I know you're going to say, Jim, I spatchcock a 24-pound turkey all the time. I'm saying most people aren't going to do it. It won't. A turkey that size will overhang a regular half sheet. And a half sheet, half, you know, half sheet baking sheet, which is 12 by 18, is what a regular home oven can accommodate. You won't be able to accommodate a three-quarter or a full sheet in a home oven. So don't want to get you confused here. I would say stick to a 12-pound turkey or two 12-pound turkeys. Okay. Yeah. Words of wisdom. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I've made a few turkeys, you know, in my life. And mm -hmm. honestly, with all the turkeys I made, you're always better off just going with a turkey breast. You are. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I would agree with that. All right. So it's like Disney World. You get like you, you get like these delusions of like how good a turkey is. You, if you've been to Disney World, you see all, all the you see all the men and the Neanderthals walking around with their uh, with their huge turkey legs and pretending like that they love it. And uh, they fooled me a couple times, and every time I've gotten them there, I'm like, "This is horrible." <laughs> yeah, they look they look much better than they actually are. They're kind of like stringy. And you think sinewy. they still have them there at Disney World? Oh, I'm I mean, sure. Okay, that was so long ago. Yeah, yeah, it was. God, that was like 20 years ago that we that we went. Yeah, yeah. I always remember though, like the, the the couple times I've been there, I always remember people walking around with those turkey legs. Mm -hmm. All right, I digress. So the Sunday and Monday. I think those are the days to reserve for your grocery shopping, groceries, liquor store, if you're picking up alcohol. Of course, they're going to be picking up alcohol. I mean, even if you don't drink alcohol, even, yes. some of your guests are going to be drinking alcohol. Yes, unless you can outsource that too. That's expensive outsource. That's a nice ask if somebody can, if somebody will do it for you. That's a good gift you could give to somebody too if you uh, really want to take a lot of the cost off of them. I think giving two days for grocery shopping is helpful because in my experience, sometimes one grocery store doesn't have what you're looking for. So you sometimes have to go to multiple places. Oh, yeah. And especially if you're going to go to Costco, that could be an all day event. Um, liquor store can, depending on where you where your closest liquor store is, that can also take a long time. So that's yep. why I say give the two days. And that brings us to Tuesday. Tuesday would be a good day to start making your desserts, right? So if you're making any type of pie that requires you to make homemade dough, you can do that. And the dough can sometimes sit there for two days ahead of time. I know for our apple crostata, which is something yep. that we make for Thanksgiving, that dough can sit for two days. That's two days in the fridge. You can It can mm. sit for months in the freezer. Yes, so, I'm yeah. talking about in the refrigerator. Yeah. Yep. Because at this point, I don't think you really want to be freezing anything and then defrosting. I mean, if they're listening to this when, when, we, when this airs, they could make the dough and then freeze it. They could make the dough at the seven to 10 day yeah. mark, the same time that yeah. they're making the lasagna and buying the frozen turkey. You would just thaw it then in your refrigerator and like take it out the morning of, you could take it out or the night before, and then you'll be able to work with it. Mm -hmm. So also for Tuesday, if you're going to make a tiramisu, this would be a perfect time to do it. Tiramisu needs to sit for at least a day in the fridge, but is fine to sit for two days until Thanksgiving. So that's a big one. I don't really recommend you do. If you do that for, you know, you're going to someone's house, that would be a great gift to bring. 
um, or somebody bringing it for you because that that is a little bit involved. Yeah, that. it's not a traditional Thanksgiving yeah. type of dessert, but I know a lot of people do yeah. like to make it. Another thing you could do on the Tuesday is make the cranberry sauce and brine the turkey breast. Even the day before, you could brine the turkey breast. For a 12-pound turkey uh, dry brine, and I only recommend dry brine, uh, you only need about 16 hours, for, even 14 hours will be fine. I mean, I, I dry brine pork chops. I do two hours. Yeah. Well, all dry brine does is it just you're getting – Salt, it's going inside there. It's osmosis. It basically will penetrate and it will, the juices will come up and it'll go back in. It'll just make your turkey juicier and it's already salted now. You don't have to do any salt when you roast it. A wet brine is something that, uh, same principle the way it works, but you know, if a turkey's big and then you have to get, say, like three mil thick garbage bags and put all your liquid in there with the bag, tie it, hope that nothing, uh, that it doesn't open, maybe stick it in some like 80 gallon cooler. And it just gets ridiculous. It's actually the first time and last time I ever did a wet brine for a turkey was probably uh, over 20 years ago. I was following an Alton Brown uh, recipe or vi video he did on uh, Food Network. I would go on on a limb here and say Alton Brown does not wet brine his turkeys either anymore. You know, you always think that these people know everything. He was probably learning how to brine a turkey when he made that episode because now every single piece of bit of information tells you to dry brine your turkey, your pork chops, everything. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just so much easier. Yeah. So I, when I mentioned this, I said brine the turkey breast. I really meant if you're using a turkey breast or a turkey, so it could be for either. Yeah. Now you could you could brine a turkey breast too. Just you. This is really important to look out for. Most turkey breasts that you buy will already be pre brined. You have to read the nutritional information. Now, meat itself, whether it's turkey, pork, beef, has a certain amount of sodium in it. It's a very minuscule amount, but you know, we all have sodium in us, all right? Animals have it. These ones will often say in an 8% solution containing X amount of sodium, you do not want to brine that. Then you will have an extremely overly salty uh, turkey. And by the way, uh, the amount percentage brine will be I mean, there's some recipes that are very popular, like big bloggers, where they're only brining at like a 0.25% amount of sodium per pound. So simply to do this math, uh, a pound is 454 grams. If you're working with, say, a 10-pound turkey, now you have 4,540 grams. If you take 1% of that, you will have roughly 45 grams of salt that you need. Okay, very simple math I'm doing here right now. A tablespoon of salt, uh, regular uh, table salt is 20 grams. So you would need two and a half roughly or two and a quarter tablespoons of salt to brine at a 1% sodium level. Don't worry if you're not following along with everything here. It's everywhere on the internet, but there'll be books like there's books, some famous books that will tell you to brine at a one and a half percent sodium level. And then some will tell you like I said, some of those blogs to do at a very s small level. My safe amount to do a turkey is about 1 to 1 1.25%. Again, that's just sodium level per pound. And that pound weight is including the bones of the bird. So it's very simple. It, I, I, did, that, did that confuse you? I mean, I, I'm sorry. Even if you can't, like, you know, Jim, you're talking too fast for me. Don't worry. It's all, it's all, every, it's everywhere on the internet. You just have to understand. If you go at a 1% rate, chew the weight, and you don't, you know, I think where it gets complicated, people think, oh, well, I got to factor in the weight of the bones. No, it's just a full weight of the bird. Mm. That's it. Okay. That's it. <laughs> I'm trying. That was some Mr. Wizard type stuff right there. Well, I mean, I, I've, I've been doing this for a long time. So yeah. like, it's not, you should know this. If you if you cook for a living, you you will know, or, or you pretend to cook for a living, you will know uh, what you should be brining at. You can overdo it. You I'll can trust that. You can destroy <laughs> stuff if you put too much salt on it. Well, okay, so just be careful. Yeah. yeah. All right. So Wednesday, the day before, right? Wednesday morning, or Wednesday during the day, you can start taking care of some of the side dishes, like the if you're making roasted vegetables, if you're doing a sweet potato casserole, if you're making stuffed mushrooms as an appetizer cinnamon roasted butternut squash, stuffing, all of those things can be made Wednesday during the day. Yes. And then refrigerate it. 
right? Definitely. Now, everything can be made ahead of time, really, except for mm-hmm. the turkey. I mean, and the turkey can be made ahead of time, but I don't recommend it. Wednesday night, set your table. That's going to eliminate one more thing for you to do on the day of Thanksgiving. So set, get the table set and ready to go. Um, you can prep any sort of crudite, like raw vegetables that you're going to be serving. Maybe you're going to serve it with, I don't know, we have a cannellini bean dip on the website. We've got the or spinach, an anti- spinach artichoke dip, any kind of any kind of dip. Or if they're doing antipot, you know, like if they're doing olives, salami, If all you're that doing stuff, that, yeah. you can assemble that platter, that antipasto yeah. platter also. Just get it ready to go, cover it with some plastic wrap, yeah. get it back in the fridge. Very simple. If you are making the lasagna and if you made it the seven to 10 days and froze it, you should take it out and thaw it in the refrigerator at this point. They, you don't have to. You can you can bake it, but it will take probably three hours to bake versus if you thaw it, it will only take like an hour or mm-hmm. an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah, so you can you can yeah. get it in the oven, but it depends on, on really, yeah. I think, what your oven real estate is going to look like on Thanksgiving. So keep yeah. that in mind. The other thing I've got that you can do the night before, and this kind of goes back to... When you plan your menu, if you're going to just serve wine and beer, that's great. But if you want to do something a little bit extra, I think making like a sangria or some type of punch is something that can be made in bulk and your guests can kind of just serve themselves is a great idea. So we actually have a Thanksgiving sangria recipe. Sangria is even better when it's made the night before. Yeah, definitely. Right, because then the, the fruit- Needs to macerate. Yes, the fruit kind of soaks up some of the alcohol. Yep. It it just, it will taste so much better. That's what all Spanish restaurants do. They mm-hmm. all, they have it sitting. Yep, so I would say make the sangria with all of the ingredients except for the club soda, right? Because yes. usually club soda or Sprite or some other type of um, effervescent- beverage is added right before serving. Right before. Yeah. So make it, get it in the fridge, just don't add the club soda yet. And that's that's everything you're going to want to do Wednesday night. Yeah, that sounds good to me. So then Thursday morning, it's the big day, right? Maybe you were up. Big day. Panicking, having heart palpitations in the middle of the night. Hopefully not, because All hopefully of- you listened to us. Yeah. and <laughs> It's going to be fine. And Uncle Bob and Uncle... Rico Uncle and Rico. everybody else is going to be, they're going to be in the living room. Or and Napo- den. Napoleon yeah. and Kip. They're going to be watching the football game. All right. Uncle Rico. They're going to be, that's where they're going to be. Yeah. Uh, now I want to do my Napoleon Dynamite impersonation. <laughs> you know, she saw uh, the guy who plays Uncle the Uncle Rico actor. Uh, do you know his name? Do you remember his name? Is it John Grise? I don't know. I was asking you. Yeah. Because Tara saw him recently at uh, a Napoleon Dynamite read in, that was Patchogue, right? Yeah, so the Patchogue Theater had a showing of Napoleon Dynamite, which I love. My sister and I both love the movie. Um, we're huge Napoleon dorks. And Definitely. we went, they showed the movie, so we got to watch it. And then um, John Heater, who plays Napoleon, Efren Ramirez, who plays Pedro, and... I think it's John Grise who plays Uncle Rico. The three of them were there and they came out and they they talked to the audience. They took audience questions. It was really for maybe like an hour and a half that they were there. And it was so fun and so entertaining. But yeah, he's in White Lotus now. So he's like- Yeah, Jonathan Grise. Jo- okay, yeah. yeah. Little side story there. Yeah, he's in he's in White Lotus. If you haven't seen White Lotus, great, great show. Very odd show. Uh, it's awesome. Waiting for season three. Yeah. All is, right. It's really good. Okay. So Thursday morning, right? So you've woken up, you've taken a deep breath, you're ready to get the day started. It's going to be a great day, right? Yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be a great day. Okay. So one thing you could do first thing Thursday morning when you get up, I do recommend getting up super early on Thanksgiving if you can, if you're hosting. You'll just feel better prepared. If you sleep a little too late, that's when the anxiety starts to creep in and you feel a little less in control, right? I, I'm speaking I, from personal experience. Well, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm, I think Tara's, yeah, this is her experience. I'm always <laughs> fine. Okay, whatever. No, my biggest stress point, and we'll talk about it in a second, is the food not staying hot. Mm-hmm. That gets me, I get really uh, sad and 
I do. I, I get sad and I get emotional, and but I have a solution. Yes, we'll talk about that yeah. when we get to our top tips. Okay, so in the morning of Thanksgiving, you can, if you're going to make homemade dinner rolls, you can prepare that dough that can kind of sit and proof throughout the day. That's right. Just we have a recipe for garlic butter dinner rolls on the website if you want to look at that yeah. one. It's great. You can also get your turkey in the oven, right? That's something that should start earlier in the day. And you can boil your potatoes for mashed potatoes. I'm a firm believer that mashed potatoes should not be made a day ahead of time. They're best when they're made fresh. But boiling the potatoes will kind of give you a head start. If you make the mashed potatoes a day ahead of time, you know, I would, at that point, I would make like the old school um, Italian uh, potatoes where you mix the eggs in and the Parmesan cheese. Oh, it's more then, like a casserole? Yeah, so it's like a twice baked potato almost. And that's great. But no, make your mashed, th that is the one, Tara's right, that is the one thing besides the turkey that you should be making towards that point. Mm -hmm. As far as the dinner rolls go, you can make them the day before. So what you would do is you would just, you know, put your, your water, your yeast, let it proof. Then you would just form your balls. You could do a second rise. You should do a second rise, you know, put a, a towel over them. And once they're where you like them, then you could just put park that in the fridge. And once you park it in the fridge, it's like, you know, you're cold fermenting it. First of all, it's going to improve the flavor a little bit, but it's just going to kind of stop the proofing process. The cold, the cold temperature just really slows everything down. And then you could just take them out and you don't even need to warm them up the next day. They can go straight into the oven from that point. That, really easy. That wouldn't, if, if it's in like a baking dish, like a glass baking dish, would that create any type of thermal shock or something? Because I have heard of that happening. It's possible. I mean, so yeah, you, you know what? You might be right. Maybe warm it up a little bit or just put them in a, on a baking tray, mm -hmm. which, which is even easier, which which is so often how I'll bake them. Yeah. yeah something that's not glass. Yeah. Yeah. Just an aluminum tray. Yeah. The other thing you should do in the morning is make sure you're, if you have a dishwasher, make sure it's emptied so that it's ready to accept all of the Definitely. dirty dishes that will be coming its way. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that our advice here is better than any other podcast pre-Thanksgiving piece of content in the world. That is a very bold statement. No, you know why? It comes from decades of experience and decades of experience of do basically being the one who's always preparing the whole Thanksgiving. I mean, I'm trying to think when when our parents stopped doing it and it became us. It's so it's been so many years. So every year my mom wants to have Thanksgiving. Yeah. And I feel bad. She does she lives in Pennsylvania. Yeah. She wants to host it. It's just it's hard for us to take a trip to Pennsylvania when the kids have yeah. school and so that's why we wind up hosting it every year. It's that's not for true. her lack of no, I know offering. That. If you recall, I think it was our first Thanksgiving when we moved back from Minnesota. We did go to my mom's yeah, for Thanksgiving. But we were doing, even in the early 2000s, we were still doing the Thanksgiving at our place. Yeah, I remember being pregnant and hosting Thanksgiving, yeah. like pregnant with Sam. So I think we've been doing Thanksgiving for probably almost 20 years. I and mean, I, she's she's yeah. 15, but. Because I remember clearly there was, and I think I said this in a previous episode, that place that didn't deliver the turkey. Remember we got a fried turkey and then they didn't deliver? That's right. Yeah, so I know, and that was like circa 2006 mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, so that's a yeah. long, it's, 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 been, it's been a long time. That was in 2011. Oh, 2011. Okay, I'm way off. Yeah. Yeah, this place, I think they're out of business now. Uh, they would, they got on local TV and they do fried turkeys. This was a place in Brooklyn and they happily took our money and everybody else's money, probably over a thousand orders, and they didn't deliver. That's they right. They didn't deliver. So people were not, people were so mad. I was, I was furious because, you know, it was a lot of money. First of all, it was like a very expensive turkey. Yeah. And they didn't deliver it. And then I uh, wrote like, I've never wrote a negative review in my life of anything. Mm -hmm. Like that's why I always like laugh when I get people on YouTube telling me that like I should die and everything like in like I'm the worst cook ever. It's just like, but this one was justified of me giving this negative review and I did it on Yelp because I don't even think Google reviews was a thing yet. I don't think so. And Yelp deleted my comment and apparently Yelp deleted 
another thousand comments mm -hmm. because we all put a bad comment because none of us got our turkey delivered. We all did it at the same time. And they were saying that their algorithm to prevent other businesses from, you know, writing a negative yeah. m mass negative reviews for another establishment. The problem is in that in that instance, it was 100 percent justified. So I did a charge back and so did another thousand people. And I think that's what precipitated them uh, going out of business, because if you get too many chargebacks on a merchant account, you are finito. Yeah. Goodbye. Done. And you there's something I mean, you know, if, you, if you're a business owner, you know what I'm talking about. You do not want chargebacks. It's a shame because the company probably it did make a good turkey. They probably didn't account for the growth that they would be experiencing following. I, I forget what what show they were on. That that kind of it was like local, like them. Fox Five or yeah, something. Yeah, like so that. they were just not prepared for that, and yet they still took orders. They really should have just shut the system down. But I will give a shout out to Zorns yes. in Farmingdale. Which I think is still around. They are. Yep. Zorn's is like a yeah. staple yeah. in Farmingdale. Yeah, you can get that, all that area. You can get all of your Thanksgiving. Yes. Turkey, chicken, sides, whatever. But they have fresh them. turkeys, yeah. and they were open Thanksgiving morning. So yeah. that's where I went. That's right. Picked up the fresh turkey, and Zorn's saved Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's so funny. I totally forgot about that place, but uh, yeah, that's like an institution over there. It is. Yeah, it is. So. Right as your guests start to arrive, that's when you want to, if you're making the sangria, you want to add the club soda. Maybe you want to serve it in a little punch bowl or a pitcher or even those, uh, you know, those beverage dispensers with like the little. I like those. Little nozzle. Yeah. Those are good because then people can just yep. get some ice and they can serve themselves. Um, you'll put out the appetizers and greet your guests. Right? That's right. You have a stromboli there. That would be nice. Yes. That's something definitely consider outsourcing. Just yeah. be like, hey, Aunt Betty, Uncle Bob, I'm make using the, your words. Make the stromboli. Can you please make a stromboli and bring it over and then just pop it in the oven for a few minutes. Yeah. And, or buy a stromboli. They yeah. can buy one from numerous places. So right before dinner, you want to start to finish your mashed potatoes, right? So that they're nice and creamy yeah. and ready to go. Because like we said, if you kind of make them too far in advance, yeah. they can get gluey and just i recommend a ricer it's the way to do it uh you don't have yes. to though you could just do a, a rough rustic mash with a potato masher which is easy yes and check out the recipe on our site for roasted garlic mashed potatoes you don't have to add the garlic to yeah. it you could use the yeah. same method but jim shows exactly how to do it you use the ricer yeah, use the in, ricer. In I, the pictures. And I give you the pro exact proportions based on, I think it's four or five pounds of potatoes, but mashed potatoes and all cooking. I mean, if you watch the channel, you know that I do. I can do everything by feel. That's the ultimate goal here with you watching us is that you will be able to do everything by feel yourself. You'll be able to commit certain things to memory the more you cook. Like you'll know, oh, a dry brine should be 1% or 1.25% of weight. You'll eventually know all this stuff, but yeah, when it comes to the mashed potatoes, you'll know, okay, oh, you know, this recipe says this much butter, but it's just, it's not good enough yet. I'm going to add another couple tablespoons of butter. I'm going to put some more milk in this or some cream or more salt, obviously. So mm. that's, that's going to be all you to get them to taste perfect. That's right. All right. The other thing you can do right before dinner is if you made the dinner rolls, I would say bake the dinner rolls because those are really good when they're fresh out of the oven and warm. And Jim... When you pull the turkey out, what are you going to do with all the turkey drippings? Yeah, so the turkey drippings obviously save. You can make your gravy. If you do a spatchcock turkey, you'll be able to have the backbone. Uh, turkeys will most mostly will always come with the giblets, uh, so you can make gravy out of that as well. You can use the neck. With a regular turkey, especially if you're doing a larger turkey, and say you're doing a whole turkey and you, you know you didn't spatchcock it and you're in a big baking uh, pan, you know, like roasting pan, you will have so much. So you can get a lot of the fat out and then you can just make a simple gravy where you could just do a roux. You can do a roux with some of that fat that you took out and flour, okay? And then just, you could cook it for a minute, that flour, or you could cook it for like 10 minutes to get get some color on that, almost like, you know, like you're doing a gumbo. And then you add your drippings back in there. You can supplement with chicken stock if you don't have enough. I like to put a little white wine in my gravy. I like to put sage, 
salt, pepper. Sometimes I'll do some shallots, sometimes some onion. Really, really simple. Uh, the, the thickness level is just going to be dependent on, on your flour. And if you say like you do your roux and you're like, oh, it's not thick enough and it's ruined. It's not ruined. Just take some of that gravy out, put it in a cup, mix some, whisk some flour into it some more, pour it right back in, boil it, and uh, and you're set. Flour is a better thickener, in my opinion, for a traditional gravy than cornstarch. Cornstarch is has a, is a stronger thickener. It's about double the strength of flour, and it's good and it's easy. And it will give a kind of like a, a shiny, silky appearance almost mm -hmm. to your gravy. Kind of like when, you know, when you go to a Chinese restaurant and everything, they use cornstarch on everything. So, but then if you notice whenever you reheat the Chinese food, the gravy, the sauce will be thin mm. because it, you don't get a second reheat with cornstarch. Mm, that's a good point. With flour, you do. So, but flour will have a duller appearance. And flour takes about three, four minutes for it to hydrate enough when you're making the gravy for the thickening to start. Cornstarch will just thicken kind of right away. Once the bubbles start, it will start thickening. That's true. Yeah, you, know, you can use other thitheners too, like potato starch and arrowroot and, oh God, I don't know. There's a, there's other ones to do, but traditionally it's flour mm -hmm. and then cornstarch would be the secondary. So after dinner is over, I'm going to give a piece of advice here that I don't ever take myself and I probably will try and take it this year. A lot of times a guest will offer to do the dishes. And I'm like, no, don't worry about it. I'll do it. And I stand there and wash dishes and get them in the dishwasher because I'm like anal retentive and I want stuff done the way I want it done. But that is a good thing to outsource and it allows you to kind of start to get things ready for dessert if, if you have a guest help with the dishes. So I encourage you to be a little more hands off with the dishes if someone offers. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. It's honestly, it's something we struggle with with our kids. And I think a lot of parents do. You, uh, or, or say, you're, say you're a business owner and you have a, a new new employee, they're not gonna learn or be able to learn until unless you let them do it. So it'll be a little slower to have that relative do the dishes for you, but it's it's pro it's probably worth it. It's probably you gotta, tra you gotta train them for the next couple of years, yeah. you know? Then they'll be doing dishes for you for the rest of your life. So remind me on Thanksgiving, be like, Tara, let so-and-so who just offered, let them do the yeah. dishes. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna take my own advice this year. Okay, so then you're almost done, right? Yep. You have dessert, you have coffee. If you have a coffee urn, now is a great time to use it. I have a top tip, which we'll get into in top tips. But if if you don't have a coffee urn, now might be a good time to get a box of Joe from Dunkin'. And you can get it in the morning. It stays hot all day. Or that could be one of those things you outsource to somebody. You say, you know what? When you're on your way over here, can you stop at Dunk if you have a Dunkin' near you? I know other, like Tim Hortons, other places have like the big box of coffee. Just be like, can you? Can you pick up a box of coffee and bring it? Because it stays hot the whole day. And I've done that on so many occasions, like for the kids' christenings, when I just, I didn't have the giant coffee urn. So I wanted to be able to serve coffee and it makes it so much easier. Sounds good to me. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. All right. You don't want to be making like a ton of cups of coffee. At, That's it'll right. It'll slow you down too much. That's right. And of course, you know, have have tea for for folks who like yeah. tea. And Nobody's going to care at that point. Uncle Bob and everybody else is going to be wasted. <laughs> it's not going to matter. <laughs> All right. So let's move into top tips. I already talked about my box of Joe top tip. Jim, sternos. Talk to us about sternos. Okay. So everything has been leading up to this. This is the most important thing that I can give you from this whole entire episode. Sternos. It's a one-time investment. the The renewable invest uh, the renewable cost simply is getting the uh, the actual sternos. I think sterno rack. Yeah, sterno racks are the metal things. The sternos are the little uh, heat heat things. They're like a little metal can, and they have like a gel in there that keeps them going for like eight hours. If you buy the racks, you buy like eight of them or ten of them. You go to a restaurant supply store. You can also order them online. Then. You you know now you got to serve your food in metal trays half half or full trays but you could buy all these trays at Costco you put a little bit of water in the tray in one tray then you put your other trays on top of it you light your sternos you have warm food for hours and that's all you need with Thanksgiving it's not like you're running a barbecue competition and you're 
you know, like it's an all day thing where you have to keep refilling water and keeping it going for eight hours. But by doing this, you will have all of your sides will be perfect. They will be hot. And this is to me, it's more important than anything. So I do this for Thanksgiving. I do it for Christmas. I do it for Christmas Eve. I do it for Easter. I do not want the thing that I spent a lot of time on to be cold. And I absolutely don't want somebody putting it in the microwave after I made it and ruining it. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have the, like the downside to sternos, which I agree with you, I think sternos are great, especially if you're having, you know, 10 plus people. The downside to sternos is that if you're looking to have that like, you know, Instagrammable, fancy Thanksgiving table with everything in your Le, Le Creuset casserole dishes that looks really pretty, like sternos don't look pretty. Yeah, but that's impossible. That's all a lie. See, that's like I'm you just know, saying. But that's cooks, the downside. You're you're, you're you're listening to this. You're, you you know I I know I know you cook. You 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 know and I know that that's all a lie. You're not going to be able to have the food hot for, and, and especially to get everything out at the same time, and then to get nice pictures, and then get Uncle Bob to the table <laughs> because he's doing a keg stand or something in the backyard, you know, like, and then and got all the got all the youngins watching him, you know, like, it's just, it's not going to happen. So the sternos will give, everybody now can get their plates at their leisure, you know. I'm still thinking, <laughs> thinking of Uncle Bob. I'm just going with Uncle Bob permanently just so I don't have to, uh you know, slip or anything. This is no offense to, to the Bobs of the world. No, no offense to, to the good Bobs out there. And yeah, that's it. It's just, it's just a name that comes to me easy. Did you have any more you wanted to say about Sternos? Our daughter just got off the bus. So that's gave us a little intermission here, which our daughter who you never see. Okay. But she's, she was actually, was, wasn't she in an episode? Oh, she was in a Patreon episode, right? The picky eater Patreon episode. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Subscribe to our Patreon. All right. Um, now she just doesn't want to be in them anymore. She's, uh, she's at that age. The only thing about them, the negative about sternos would be you would have to have a place to store them. I think the best place to put them is in say like a basement or a garage. And they do stack. The they racks stack, stack on top of each other. They're stackable. So that's good. Yeah. Costco doesn't sell the sterno racks. They sell the trays. Mm -hmm. I feel like in the past they did. Restaurant Depot and any restaurant supply store will sell all of it. Yeah, I think party supply stores will and sell party too. supply stores too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So sternos, that was a top tip. I already talked about getting the box of coffee. Let me just say one more thing. I'm sorry. Okay. You will never be able to get that Instagrammable shot and have good food. I can't say never. It will be almost impossible. It, it's really hard. Something will be cold or more than likely a lot of things will be cold. Sternos prevent that. Mm-hmm. I agree. If you're opposed to it, you're opposed to it. I, I get it. I mean, I know it's not for everyone. All right. So we talked about sternos. I already talked about the top tip of getting a box of Joe from Duncan. Yep. Or some other box of coffee. Um, the other tip is have coolers ready to go in your house so that if somebody does show up with something that requires refrigeration, you can pop it in a cooler. A cooler is also a great place to just store your beer and your wine for people that yeah. are that are coming. That way, they're not going into the fridge and taking things definitely in and out. And depending on depending on where you live, uh, if you, like you know, we live in New York, and some some Thanksgivings will be twenty five degrees outside, and that means that all the beer and wine and even the turkey could go outside. And, but then some years it'll be sixty five degrees. Yeah, you never know what you're yeah, going to get. You don't here. know. Yep. And then the final tip, which I did already talk about before, was if you want to have like a fancy cocktail, serve serve something that's like a big batch drink, like a Definitely. sangria or a punch. Or just a bottle, like get a couple of bottles of wild turkey, you know, <laughs> for for Bob. And Have you ever had wild turkey? No, you know, the only reason I'm even saying it is your uncle, Chris, would always have wild turkey at his house. He so, would? Yeah, he would always have wild turkey. And I remember him and like Larry and like Timmy would always be like, oh, don't let somebody have too much wild turkey tonight. You really don't remember it? I don't remember happened? wild turkey. I remember my uncle Larry would have Strega, which is an Italian no. uh, liqueur. No, the wild turkey. I don't remember wild turkey. It's funny. I know more about this with her family members than she does because I was 
probably the one who was over there with with them, you know. Well, with the guys. Yeah. Yeah. Moving on, those that's kind of the game plan. I do have some tips for being a good guest. Yeah, okay. Right? From the words of a hostess. So it can be kind of frustrating when a guest brings something that requires them to take up space in the kitchen to prep and cook. So if you want to be helpful, bring something that's already fully assembled and ready to go with maybe warming up in the oven or the microwave being like the only thing that they have to do with it. Um, Here are some good make and what am I calling these? Make and take dishes, salads, charcuterie or antipasto platters that you've already assembled. Stuffed mushrooms, cannellini bean dip, spinach artichoke dip, stromboli, tarali, shrimp cocktail. Those are all great things for you to bring. Yeah. Fully made, fully assembled to someone else's home that won't frustrate the hostess. Again, try and bring desserts that don't require refrigeration. If you do and they don't have room in the fridge, your dessert might not <laughs> might not make yeah. it there. Um, and then as far as host and hostess gifts, it's really lovely when someone brings you a gift, like a bouquet of flowers or something like that. But when you bring someone a bouquet of flowers, what does that do? That stops them from doing whatever it is that they're doing in the kitchen or entertaining guests, greeting guests, getting them drinks, etc. It forces them to find a vase, maybe cut some stems, put those things in flat in in what put the flowers in water, and find a place to put it. So instead of doing a really nice gesture and bringing flowers, which I think on any other occasion is yeah. a lovely gift, it is a nice gesture. But I get, I get what you're saying. But it's something that can be. You mean well, but it you're creating more work for someone who's already incredibly busy trying to can run I, a whole dinner. Can I just tell a story about the, the, what my uncle did to me that gave me the most work ever? <laughs> yes. I know he's not listening to this. So we had a Memorial Day party here, you know, over the summer. This was the most recent Memorial Day. And he came to the house and he said, Jimmy, uh, he said, I got the keg for you. I said, I got the keg uh, that your cousin got for you. So I said, I have no idea what you're talking about, Charlie. And he said, uh, he said, it's in my trunk. He has like a Kia, something like an SUV. And he opens it. And I'm like, okay, it's going to be like one of those little tiny, like Heineken, you know, like 10 beer <laughs> mini kegs, keg. mini yeah. keg, like tiny kegs. It's a full size keg, which weighs like 190 pounds. He's like, oh, he's like, can you get it out? I'm like, oh my God, you know, like, what are you, like, this isn't college anymore. Like, I'm not, I'm going to have a hernia. And so, so I summoned like the dad strength that I had and I ripped the keg out of there and uh, I put it in my wheelbarrow <laughs> and I wheeled it all the way to the back. And I was just like, you know, again, Tara's talking about like giving somebody, you know, flowers, giving him trouble. <laughs> my cousin comes there. I'm like, Jeff, I got the keg. I'm like, thank you. You know, I was, I, but I wasn't like happy about it. I was like, thanks. It was like only like 25 people there. And uh, he, he didn't even know what I was talking about. So like 30 minutes later, Charlie's like, Jeff, I picked up the keg from, uh, from the beer distributor. Jeff's like, uh huh. And then he goes into like where we have it. He's like, oh my God. He's like, I didn't mean for you to get me a keg. He's like, I was joking with you, Charlie. He's like, how do they even sell you a keg? And he's like, I just told him I'm here to get the keg for Jeff. So anyway, long story short, the beer distributor came back, picked up the keg. We told him we didn't drink any of it, even though it was tapped for like a couple couple beers. And uh, that's the end of it. I can't believe I was able to move that thing. Yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> I mean, I moved that thing from the front yard all the way to the back. So long story short, don't buy anybody a keg. Don't bring a keg. Unless they ask for it. All right, let's move on. That was actually one of the funniest things. Yeah. That it was just a joke. What are the chances that the beer distributor would have a keg for a Jeff and they would just like a, give it well, to they have whoever be, picked it up? Beer distributors have like 80 kegs ready to yeah, go. So yeah. that that's the thing. It wasn't even like a good beer. It was like Bud It was Light. like Miller White. But the, <laughs> and then the guy who came from the beer distributor to get it, it's this young kid, he's like 20. He got the keg. He had this special... Uh, dolly that's a keg dolly so you know if you work in bars you'll know it has like a hook 
So because you put it on there, put it on the dolly and, you know, it'll just spin off, but it hooks onto the handle so it can't spin. So he just like put it on there and wheeled it out. I was like, oh God, I'm like, I wish I had that. I was like, I put that thing in the wheelbarrow. I was, oh. I was worried about it. I thought I'll, you were I'll, like, I'm not feeling hernia. good even thinking about lifting that thing right now. <laughs> oh God. I used to be strong when I was young. I, was, I used to work out a lot, but uh, not anymore. Okay. Not anymore. I just turned 45. I'm old. <sighs> okay. So we are going to move into questions. But before we do that, Jim, anything you want to add to the Thanksgiving game plan? Don't buy a keg and get sternos. Yeah. But anything beyond what we already talked about? I think I went over everything. I didn't really talk about how to cook a turkey. And I, I, I did say quickly that spatchcock is the way to go. If, regardless of which way you do, if you cook a turkey, you're never going to have properly cooked white meat and dark meat at the same time. It's actually impossible. It's an impossibility. So dark meat is always better at 185, 190 because the connective tissue starts to break down. It just gets more tender. It's easier to eat. It's moister. It's it's just a better experience. But you can't cook your turkey to 185 because then the white meat, which is what everybody's there for anyway, will be cardboard. So what you can do is, if you really want to do this, you can re- Remove it when it hits 155, roughly, the white meat. You can put a probe in there. You can remove the breasts, carve, you know, take them off, tent them. Then you can throw all the dark meat back in, put a thermometer in, like the thickest part of the leg or whatever, and get it to 180, 185, and it will be a much better experience. That's, that's a tip. There's nothing revolutionary about this tip. Other people have no doubt come to the same conclusion that you have to do this. Mm-hmm. It's it's all it's I'm sure it's all over different recipe sites that are telling you how to optimally cook a turkey. All right, Jim, let's move into questions. Question time. This question is from Monica. Monica says, "Why does chicken cacciatore recipe call for white wine when it's cooked in a red tomato sauce? Have you ever used red wine with this recipe?" Also, I have seen other recipes coat their chicken in flour before frying. Have you cooked it this way? Lastly, I've seen another chef serve this dish on top of oven roasted potatoes. Seems like a versatile dish. Discuss. Huge fan, Monica. <laughs> oh, discuss. Okay, Monica. Monica. Yeah. Okay, Monica. There's a billion ways to make chicken cacciatore. Chicken cacciatore is one of. The, this is one of those recipes that there is no official recipe. So, if you're talking about certain things in Italy, like say like uh, bucatini amatriciana, that has an official recipe. Okay, in amatrice, Italy. There's other things like that. There's plenty of things like that. And there's plenty of anal retentive Italian people to let you know that you're not doing it the way that it has to be done. Cacciatore is not one of those dishes. It's a hunter's stew. It's, there's a, you know, often it's done with rabbit, first of all, not with chicken. And it can have all different types of ingredients in there. And that includes, it can have white wine or red wine. The difference between using white wine and red wine, and I prefer for real for most dishes to cook with white wine. To me, it gives a better acid, acidic nature to it. It um, brightens things more. Red wine, I always like to cook with when I want something deep and dark. I, I, I'm i not using the correct adjectives here, but red, what I would use for like, if I want to do like a deep and dark Sunday sauce with say like brajol or, or meatballs, uh, like neck bones, doesn't mean red wine can't be substituted for almost all the white dishes. The only time you can't substitute red wine is when you're making seafood dishes. When you're doing, or like say chicken piccata, you know, you're not going to make chicken piccata with red wine. It just doesn't. Yeah. So, so essentially white wine is the base that you can use for everything. And then red wine, you cannot use all the time. So I guess that is why I use white wine more. You can't use white wine for Poposo. No, you can't use white wine for Poposo. That is correct. It would be, it'd be, it'd be an odd thing trying it. What was the other part of the question too? Serving on potatoes? Oh, not flouring yeah, and, the chicken? Yeah. I flour the chicken on almost all recipes. I'm surprised I didn't do it in this recipe. I might have to update it. I flour beef and chicken so much that I get 30 comments a day telling me that I'm not flouring it right or, or <laughs> that you know you or that I flour too much. 
<laughs> you, you seriously, you know that. <laughs> I it's, know it's crazy the amount of comments. I know. And what was there was our last part? Oh, on potatoes. On top of oven roasted potatoes. That sounds that sounds delicious, Monica. I think I should make it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next is a question that, Jim, I already asked you this question, but we didn't have an answer. So we are putting this question out to our listeners. This is a question from Brian. Brian's in the Army, and he's stationed in South Korea. Brian said the local markets and the commissary do not carry Italian products like pancetta, prosciutto de parma, sauces, etc. Do you recommend a reliable vendor for online delivery worldwide? Now, we answered... Brian's question and said that, you know, Amazon will often carry a lot of these products, but I am not familiar with whether or not Amazon delivers to South Korea or, you know, so we wanted to put this question out to our audience. If you know the answer, you can either send me an email to podcast at sipandfeast.com and I will respond to Brian via email directly. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can drop your answer in the YouTube comments. Um, Thank you in advance to anybody who's going to answer that question for for Brian. My last question, Jim, this comes from Krista and Alejandro. Hello, and thank you for taking your time to read my question. I want to know what your must-have pantry staples are. I know bulk shopping, necessities shopping is hard for a lot of us these days, so I'd love to know what you have in your pantry. Thank you. Now, Jim, I think, can you answer this really quickly? And maybe let's do a full episode. We should definitely do a full episode. So it's Krista and Alejandro? Yes. Okay. So Krista and Alejandro, I agree with Tower. We're going to do a full episode on this. But very quickly, I always have flour. I always have bread flour and all-purpose flour. Bread flour I use to make pizza and bread. All-purpose flour I will use to flour my chicken cacciatore and and other things like that. And all-purpose flour can be used for, for breads too and stuff like that. Always have rice in there. I always have a lot of canned tomato products, whether that is 28 ounce cans of plum tomatoes or tomato paste or passata. I will also have a lot of pasta. I have a lot of pasta. And part of that is my kids eat a lot of pasta, but I also, you know, make a pasta recipe every once in a while. It's funny, like we've done, it's been six weeks in a row now that we haven't put a pasta out on the channel. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's an odd feeling. And Honestly, the non-pasta, these non-pasta videos, these beef videos have all done really well. Mm -hmm. uh, the most recent one was chicken, uh, was uh, co Cocovan. I, I, I got to say Cocovan right. Tara, can you say it right? It's cock o -va. There you go. But I'm not even probably pronouncing it correctly. You know, people like, they're like, oh, you didn't say it right. I'm like, I don't want to like start that segment, like the, the, the video. Like we're making, you know, like, <laughs> and, like I was like, all right, I'm just going to say it wrong here, you know? Yeah. Um. <laughs> it's just Jim it, you took you took like five years of French in high school too I was never able to pass my regents French yeah so yeah that's what five years of French got you I'll just go quick like yeah. other pantry supplies and Tyra correct me if I'm missing anything we'll have like a lot of hot sauces we'll have a lot of uh, different Italian products uh, olive oils vinegars Big, I always have a big jug of red wine vinegar, big jug of white vinegar, because those are versatile products. Uh, Calabrian chili, different jars of them. Uh, polenta. Cannellini beans. Yeah, and lots of beans. Lentils and split peas, because those are all shelf stable, and we do use those quite a bit. And those yep. can be used, chickpeas too. We can use those in a pinch to throw together with a pasta. That's right. So mm -hmm. I, I do the dried bag. Uh, beans, but also we have a lot of the cans. The cans are just super useful when you want to make a 30 minute meal, mm -hmm. which is just in entirely impossible if you're using, dr you know, dried beans. Yeah. But we'll go more into this in probably a full episode. Yeah. And if you listen to our Trader Joe's Fall Hall podcast, you'll know that we have like three or four boxes of Trader Joe's pumpkin pancake mix too in our pantry at any given time. <laughs> She loves Trader Joe's. You know how I uh, feel about Trader Joe's. So the other night when we couldn't figure out what to eat and I said, let's, I'll just make pumpkin pancakes and we'll have breakfast for dinner. You got very excited. <laughs> you really did. And you ate like six pancakes. I get excited when you do the cooking. And by the way, Tara does most of the cooking during the week, like get most of the meals. I'm the one who makes the videos and 
shoots the photos of the other yeah. recipes. But yeah, Tara does a lot. A few other pantry things. I try and keep potatoes, onions, and garlic. Yes, of course. Yeah, that and goes without saying. The reason why I try and keep potatoes is because lately I've been doing it like once a week or so is just making some sort of a frittata. And I always put the yep. potatoes in the frittata. So I know eggs are not a pantry item, but there's something that we shop for weekly because it's yeah. it's a good dinner to just throw together a frittata with whatever vegetables you have yes. laying around. We ju- I just had peppers laying around last week. So I did one with peppers and um, you serve it with a salad and it's yeah. it's a good meal. Yeah, oils we also have in there. We also have anchovies. We also have cans of tuna. Uh, We'll go more into it, though. Yeah, I think we should do a full pantry episode. So that is it for today. Podcast at SipAndFeast.com for your questions. We will see you next time.